Um, first of all, I just want to thank everybody for uh, joining us today for the important discussion. We've been having some community meetings um, about COVID throughout the, the, um, the whole pandemic, but what we've narrowed in on as we're doing uh, more legislation is really the disproportionate impact of COVID on our Hispanic community and our communities of color. So I'm really grateful to have such an impressive group assembled this morning to provide a really broad range of perspectives on healthcare, pastoral care, small business, education, and other things. Um, I find when, when we do these roundtables, it's so helpful as we move forward on legislation to understand the holes in, in the federal support and where we can do better. And then really um, sometimes gain better insight into the systemic problems. So I wanna introduce the members of my team on the call with us today. My district directors, Kelly Doucette and Jill Hirsch, most of you know. And then we have our team who is the healthcare legislative assistant on my legislative team. Cora Present is also joining us and she provides a bilingual casework service for the district office and would be happy to work with any of you to do casework outreach in the community. We also just added a second Spanish speaker to our district office staff um, to again, support all that outreach. With that, I'm gonna turn it quickly over to each of you to introduce yourself. If we can keep the introduction, introduction short, <coughs> that would be great so we can have time to really dive into a conversation about the issues more deeply. So I'm gonna start with Senator Ruiz. Um, she probably needs no introduction, but she is the legislative district 29th representative. She's been a huge advocate for Essex County, um, a, a great fighter on a lot of the issues we're discussing today um, and not just around issues related to our Hispanic community, but certainly I always appreciate a great fighter for women as well. So it's really an honor to have you here today, Senator. Do you wanna say a few words? Sure. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, buenos dias a todos la comunidad. To our Congresswoman for bringing us together. My name is Teresa Ruiz. I'm Senate President Pro Temp and the highest ranking Latina in the state of New Jersey uh, when it comes to elected officials. My mother will argue that she's the highest ranking uh, Latina in the state <laughs> of New Jersey, as many of our Latina mothers would would argue the, the same thing. But uh, thank you, Congresswoman, for bringing us together. Um, I'm the first Puerto Rican woman elected in the state. I only say that because it happened in 2007. You would have thought it was the, uh, you know, leave it to beaver uh, years instead. Um, voices matter. Having a seat at the table matters. Uh, uh, listening, which is what the great, great Congresswoman is bringing us together for today, extraordinarily matters. Uh, COVID-19 has been huge, but I will tell you what it has done for many of the issues that we've been fighting for. It has lent, and I'll get into this later, but it has lent power to an agenda that many people thought uh, uh, was just something in a silo that only impacted a specific community. Now that it's impacting in waves across the board, no matter what you look like, what gender, what ethnicity, and what religion, that agenda is floating up to the top in a way that is gaining more um, uh, attraction to move a policy forward. So thank you and good morning. Thank you so much, Senator. And, and what the Senator has also done, I think is really motivated uh, a group of young uh, people to get involved, maybe people who had not seen themselves represented in government and now can see that path forward. So we're just so lucky to have you uh, leading us in Trenton. Um, next, we have Luis De La Hose. It's great to see you again, although it's been a while. Uh, so I can't wait to get your thoughts on the impact on small business, especially. Can you introduce yourself to the group? Yes. Buenos dias para todos. Good morning. My name is Luis De La Hose. I'm happy to be the chairman of the statewide Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We are right now the, for a few years in a row, the largest chamber of commerce based on membership in the state of New Jersey. We are the voice of a hundred, over 120,000 Latino small business owners that contribute over a billion, uh, $20 billion to the New Jersey economy. And yet we have been affected the most. Remember that we are 30% of the population, but we hold almost 50% of the main street businesses that have been affected the most during this pandemic. Uh, but we are grateful that uh, the state have been supporting us in the sense that they have been designed a couple of uh, um, services just for minority small business owners. They actually include 
there were micro businesses in the last round of the EDA, and also that they have been focused on low and moderate income neighborhoods. And that make a difference for a lot of uh, small business owners. The EDA used to do only 500 uh, loans a year. And during 2020, they did over uh, 50,000, which make a big impact. It's not enough, but I mean, when you don't have uh, limited resources, uh, the way that they scale was really interesting. Uh, since the pandemic, we, we have been focused on four things, access to capital, access to networks, access to new markets. And since the pandemic, uh, the digital divide became the top priority. Our businesses don't use social media to promote their businesses. We do, we do use social media for personal reasons, but not necessarily to promote our businesses or to, uh, in order for us to be able to sell and collect the payments. Um, and that's what we have been working. We was able to support our businesses uh, to apply to all the, the, the resources that have been available to NJRA, to EDA, to the PPP. And we do the legwork for those businesses that the only way that they have to access the internet is through a cell phone and is not friendly when you are trying to add multiple documents at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And next we have Pastor Silva. Um, I miss seeing you in person and joining Central Biblico for services. Uh, the last time um, we were together, we were talking about the separation of children at the border. Um, and I, I will say uh, that still haunts me as it does, I think, so many people across the country. But I am glad to see that um, under the Biden administration, we're working to address that. Um, do you want to give everyone a little bit of background on yourself? Uh, yes, good morning. Uh, mm -hmm. Buenos dias. Thank you, Councilwoman Cheryl. And thank you all for being at this meeting and for the hard work that you do for our communities. My name is David Silva. I'm the senior pastor of the largest Hispanic church in Morristown. And I'm also the first elected councilman, a Hispanic councilman here. So we are making history. And um, well, uh, I came to Morristown 19 years ago, uh, sent by our organization to start the church. We have grew to four campuses in New Jersey, and we have opened also churches, sending people from our church in Morristown in Nicaragua, Honduras, Colombia, and Costa Rica. We work with children, but here in our community, we work hard. Uh, during the pandemic, we have uh, really overworked ourselves with gladness, mm -hmm. helping people with mental health, spiritual health, emotional health, and also with resources like giving food. I don't know how many pounds of food we gave throughout uh, the last year, and also partnering with other organizations like Wind of the Spirit. I'm glad to see Diana and also Xiomara. They are a great woman here in Morris County. They do great work for many years. So, um, Glad to be here and, and to um, be with you all. And thank you, Councilwoman, um, Congresswoman, for this meeting because I think it's important. And I, I'm glad to meet other people uh, that are working. And maybe at the end of the meeting, we draw some conclusions and we uh, really make some uh, uh, steps, uh, actual steps to solve uh, or to alleviate some of the needs that our community has. Thank you. Thank you, and I think that's a great idea. Um, next, let's go to Cindy Matute Brown. Uh, thanks for being here, Councilwoman. I'm so grateful to have you as a partner in West Orange. Can you introduce yourself? Absolutely, and please forgive Alexa, who's going off in the background for the first time. <laughs> that was so awkward. And when I oh, Cindy, that's not good. Now I'll just ask her to I'll ask her in the middle of something to play some music. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. Um, good morning, everyone. Buenos dias, comunidad. Um, Congresswoman Cheryl, I am so excited to join you in this effort to make sure that we're raising awareness to our um, underserved populations, and particularly in our community where so many are, and I'm going to say so many of us are a little hesitant and reluctant to trust um, uh, any new information that comes out with respect to vaccines and um, how that impacts our community. I am very 
Excited to also be a um, council president this year for uh, West Orange Township. I am very also excited that you know, during Women's History Month, West Orange has also made history where the majority of the five seated council members are all women and uh, diverse perspective um, on the council and both on our board of education. So very excited to have elected also our first Muslim Mexican representative woman to our board of education, as well as our first African American uh, Board of Ed president. So we, we are a very diverse population and, and happy to say that West Orange is, is taking large leaps and bounds to build more racially inclusive communities, um, working with policies with respect to a social um, and justice um, equity lens. So happy to be here and look forward to being able to collaborate with um, this community to make sure that we're all um, afforded the opportunity um, and access to the vaccine so we can finally see the light at the end of the tunnel um, of this pandemic and get back to um, some sort of new normal. Thank you. Here, here. <laughs> and also from West Orange, we have Rodolfo Rodriguez, the deputy, Deputy Mayor Rodriguez also heads the West Orange Hispanic Foundation. So Deputy Mayor, do you want to go next? Yes, of course. Buenos dias. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, my name is Rodolfo Rodriguez. Um, I'm the town deputy mayor for, I think, seven years. And I'm also the president of the West Orange Hispanic Foundation. Uh, basically, the two titles go neck to neck because um, West Orange uh, is a very diverse, like Cindy, our councilwoman said, community. And uh, deputy mayor, community deputy mayor, plus West Orange Hispanic Foundation go neck to neck because we are deeply involved in our community. Uh, we do so many things for our community. Like in December, we always do uh, toys for all the kids, uh, food. We do vaccine like flu shots, stuff like that. We work with San Barnabas as a partnership. I'm uh, the counsel for the hospital. So Margie Heller, Mayor Parisi, they have been big working with our organization. Uh, we first started, like we called it, West Orange Hispanic Foundation. We thought it was going to be West Orange. Then all of a sudden, we got people from Orange, East Orange, uh, from everywhere. And I said, OK, it doesn't matter. So everybody comes here. So basically, our biggest challenge is like uh, the undocumented aliens. We have been bringing them uh, free. Uh, immigration lawyers and stuff like that, helping them with the different issues that they have. And precisely this morning, somebody said, Mr. Rodolfo, how are we gonna do this vaccine, COVID vaccine? We don't have paper, what are we going to do? And you know, like one thing I've noticed through my years is like, you have to be really uh, careful picking the site where all of them have to go. Like we have done meeting by the police station, nobody go. We do it by Trinity Church, everybody's there. We got 150, we got 200 people. We do it at Washington School, we got a lot of people. So picking the place where we are, whatever we do, whatever we're doing is very, very important. So I am very glad to be part of this meeting. And uh, I really appreciate this and thank you for the invitation. Thank you, and that was such a great point too, um, which is why it's so important we have um, people on the ground so involved in our federal programs because we pass broad federal programs, but we really need to tailor them to our specific districts. Um, CMR Guevara, can we go to you next? I'm excited to hear more about the Morris County Organization for Hispanic Affairs. In our discussion today, do you mind introducing yourself? Sure, no problem. Good morning, everyone. Buenos dias. Um, my name is Xiomara Guevara, and I'm the executive director to Morris County Organization for Hispanic Affairs. We're a private non for profit. Um, we've been in the community for about 45 years now in Morris County. We serve um, all of the low income community here in Morris County, um, and we do that through different programs. We're the only ones in Morris County who provides home energy assistance and weatherization to our households here. Um, we provide home energy assistance to about 4,500 families every year, um, households. Um, 
when it comes to weatherization, our priorities are normally our seniors who are in housing. Weatherization just means that we go into homes and make sure that they're energy efficient and we do the work to get them there. <laughs> Um, our other services are case management. So we have bilingual case managers who work with families um, for, with anything, any issue, anything from child support applications to this past year, filing unemployment benefits. So our case managers are work from our Dover and our Morristown offices. Uh, we provide transportation to the community. So any seniors um, who need to get to medical or social services, same for any adult who needs to get to a social service, medical facility, and or job interviews. Um, under education, this past about, yes, this past year, we opened the first Hispanic Women's Resource Center here in Morris County. So it's one of four and all across the state of New Jersey. Um, our focus there has been training um, Hispanic women to get ready to go back to the workplace or to for the first time go into the workplace. So our education has been anything from computer, ESL, job counseling, resume building, um, and even through the pandemic, we decided this was important. So we've been doing the classes in, in our offices um, with all the precautions necessary. Um, under education, we also provide citizenship classes. And our last department is our Center for Citizenship and Legal Immigration. We provide direct legal representation to immigration um, matters, anything from asylum, family petitions, um, and citizenship, we don't do any detention work. We do partner with the Morris Family Justice Center where we provide legal services to the domestic violence victims that come to the center. Um, through that center, we provide probably, we see about 500 consultations every year. We established that center in 2014. And since then we've been able to do um, over 500, um, like I said, consultations, but also a lot of pro bono. So we do a lot of unaccompanied minors. We're part of the New Jersey Consortium of Unaccompanied Minors. Um, we do a lot of pro bono for, you know, I see our, my friends from Zoo for Health and we work closely with the doctors for unaccompanied minor, any HIV patients that they send over as well. So we do that type of work. And from there, we also grew into a new program that's called the Justice for All program that works specifically to help the immigrant children that are that we directly represent, that are children of the people that we directly represent through the center, but also any immigrant child in the community. And so, I mean, through all of these different, you know, we, we serve utility assistance, you know, we do the transportation, seniors, the isolation that we saw this past year the problems that the children had in this past year and the parents, the technology divide became even more heightened. Um, the fact that we do have services that people couldn't get to or didn't know how to apply to because they couldn't come see us was one of the reasons that we opened our doors back in September. You know, we've had, our reception has been open for our community since then because that was the only way that people really were able to get through. Um, and one of the things we're really proud, you know, all of our staff is fully bilingual, so we're able to be able to serve anybody that walks through our doors. So thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you. And um, speaking of Zufo, my heartfelt thanks goes out to all of our frontline healthcare workers. And I know Zufo um, has really been critical to help so many people, especially hard to reach people throughout our community. So Dr. Ramirez, um, do you wanna do a quick introduction? Um, sure, um, thank it you. Sounds like you might not need much of an introduction to this. <laughs> oh group. no, I'm, always, <laughs> this, I'm so honored to be here. So glad to meet all of you or see you again. My name is Rina Ramirez. I am the Chief Medical Officer of Supo Health Center. I'm also an internist. Um, we are located in six counties and serve 40,000 patients. Um, we have offices in Dover, in Morristown, and in West Orange. I'm happy to see our, our neighbors here. And uh, our, most of our patients are um, Hispanic. Um, we serve 70% Hispanic patients, 60% um, need um, um, translation services. And, uh, and like Zermada's uh, group, we, are we have bilingual staff so that it makes it easy and welcoming to take care of our patients every day. We provide primary care services uh, for women, children, um, everyone, uh, men, of course, uh, the whole spectrum of age of the lifespan, uh, HIV services, uh, behavioral health, dental, the whole gamut in addition to case management and, and, and uh, uh, services that enabling services like transportation. 
um, we were uh, we have been seeing firsthand how COVID-19 has really impacted our communities. Um, we stayed open. We have stayed open throughout the entire um, pandemic when March hit. Uh, providing telemedicine services as well as uh, walk-in services to our patients. And we've been here with them and through this, uh, including helping them with the grief, their losses, um, their scaredness, they're so anxious and scared. We've been all scared about this. And um, we've been understanding and, and seeing how we need to uh, help the community more, more than just being here for um, their health, but also for their um, um, other other things that are happening through, well, as a result of the pandemic. There's been a lot of uh, lo job loss, in insurance loss, financial distress, food insecurity, and we've been trying to address all that with our partners at, at our centers and our communities. Um, we're now doing uh, COVID testing. We've done over uh, 40, 30,000 tests so far. We are starting to do rolling out the vaccine. Uh, we've done over 4,500 vaccinations so far. Uh, so we're tr really uh, trying to be out there for our community and definitely addressing those uh, issues that make them feel that they might not be uh, so comfortable taking the vaccine and addressing the vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing. Even though a lot of our patients are very eager to take it. It depends. It's really all over the place, but I'm very happy to be able to do this for our patients and our community. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And I um, I appreciate what you said. We, we had a, a meeting with our Black community leaders as well, and there is vaccine hesitancy, and we do need to address that. Um, and, and even the locations where we're offering the vaccine, as we just heard, but I think we also can't say that that's the only problem. We need to make sure it's available to our community as well, because we do have so many people that do want to take the vaccine. Um, next, we have Jose Aguilar. It's great to see you again. I'm sure you were listening with interest to what Luis had to say. Um, and unfortunately, I think you've seen some of his complaints, not just in small businesses, but in larger businesses as well. Um, you are working in such an interesting space, but I understand during COVID, you've actually expanded access to bilingual telehealth platforms among your other work. So um, I'm excited to have you here. And can you introduce yourself to the group? Absolutely. Thank you very much, Congressman Sharon uh, Mickey. Uh, we're very excited. We're a Morris County uh, headquartered company. And what we are is a health technology company that provides access to primary care services in partnership with organizations such as yours, Uval, and others to what we call underserved communities. Luis mentioned the technology and how difficult it is to manage technology in businesses. In our view, and that's why we started the company, is actually technology and the ownership of a smartphone that most people have uh, can help have access to care to most communities. So that's what we do. We, we, we have the technology to provide those services online and remotely. Uh, also, Senator Luis and, and others have communicated that the need to reach out to communities um, and we believe that just technology can help with that. So we have been growing, as uh, Congresswoman mentioned. Uh, we launched our first bilingual telemedicine platform uh, nationwide. Tomorrow, actually, we are going to announce a big uh, partnership with Verizon. So you'll hear big news from tomorrow with Verizon Wireless on our products and services uh, for all Hispanics in, in, the, in the country. And uh, throughout this past year, we have been very concerned on access to care. You know, uh, I think also Senator Ruiz mentioned that all of a sudden the pandemic uh, indicated that minorities are being strong in the most uh, due to COVID. And for most of us who have been in this environment, it's like, obviously, you know, <laughs> we know why. So it's now time to solve those uh, barriers to have better access. And uh, I think we, again, we believe that technology can help with that. And uh, we are here to, to help. Uh, we have the solutions and uh, very glad to, to be here. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we also, uh, another wonderful institution from uh, Morris County is our Wind of the Spirit. And Diana Mejia is here. Uh, I think so much of your work is always so needed, but um, never more than now during COVID. COVID. So Diana, do you want to give a, a little bit of an um, introduction? Yes. So um, thank you. I'm, I'm very appreciate to be in this space. And thank you for coming with the Latinx community and, and, and calling us to come together and, and, and brainstorm about it. So I'm Diana Mejia. I know many of you. Um, 
we know each other from work. I came here as uh, undocumented. Um, I came from Colombia. Uh, I always say to myself, I'm going to learn English, but I never have the time. So I'm sorry for all my... I say that about mistakes. Spanish. So like <laughs> I'm sympathetic. So, <laughs> anyway, so to make the thing short, to keep the one minute, so I say it, it specifically do this um, COVID-19, when COVID-19 hit, that was uh, March actually 11 was, was declared as a pandemic. Then we decided to be open. We went open through the whole pandemic, actually. At some point, we were, besides the so far, we were the only community organization that never closed during the pandemic and in the hit time. So we were able to do a lot of census work, uh, knocking doors. We are very fortunate that uh, we have a health and safety program in Win of the Spirit. So after Ebola crisis, we start very um, educate the community about infection disease. So in some ways, um, I think that prepare, God prepared us through that trainings and have disaster site workers. Uh, they, we, de we deploy more the 30 disaster site workers, volunteers to the different communities that we're working with uh, to do census, to do outreach about COVID-19, um, helping to measure the street, understand about social distance. And we make and donate more, the, at this point, more than 13,000 face covers, 100% high quality cotton. And all of that was done by the community, all volunteers. Um, we did so many, so many things, but the, 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 for the, with, with all volunteers. So our message was many people lost their jobs, but people wants to do something. So especially that face cover project, uh, when we put together the group of, of so, como se dice costurera? So, so, so. Seems so, seems Thank you, you see? So, and, and people say, I wanna do it. I wanna get back to the community and receiving food and receiving this, that is my contribution to the community. So we call a solidarity face cover project and we are still sewing and we are still donate a face cover through the community. We also was interested through the pandemic, we learning that many families, they didn't have a thermometer. If you don't have a, a kid in your house, they didn't have a thermometer. So we were able to secure like the almost 5,000 thermometers and pass that to the community members and going to doors and explain to people how to take the temperature. So that was the little things we were able to secure, but we also were with so many uh, churches. Um, uh, one of the churches we were very close with, with, uh, with pa Pastor Jimenez, the Baptist church, Spanish church, they, they were all very involved. We were a lot with San Marga, the church, that they were basically also in the front lines, helping uh, community members in different capacities. And in another hand, we were aware with the New Jersey pandemic uh, fund. And, and then we were able to distribute more the, I think one more than million dollar, Glorita, uh, to 1500 families um, in Morris County. Also we cover plenty and so on in, in the orange. Uh, with the uh, cash cards for, for community members. Um, so that is just a little bit that we're doing, but we're happy to be in the space because uh, policy is important for us, policy, and educate communities about civil engagement um, and, and move the community agenda to, be, to make our towns a better place to live and really recognize uh, what are our um, uh, challenges regarding race, regarding language, uh, but having this kind of town halls and conversation, we can we can work together to, to definitely build in the Martin Luther King's green to be this beloved community. So thank you for this aspect and, and thank you for, for doing this. Well, thank you. If my Spanish was nearly as good as your English, I would be very proud of myself. <laughs> I wish it was. Um, finally, we have uh, Ralph Tejeda. It's great to be connected with the Morris County Hispanic Chamber. So can you briefly introduce yourself? We have Ralph. I don't have a 
the big. Um, I'm not sure. I thought he might have been one of somebody who dialed in, um, but um, maybe not. So, um, but also, uh, Mikey, we uh, um, need to get to Lori from St. Elizabeth as well. How did, I'm sorry, Lori. I must have scrolled right past you. Sorry. Can can you give our, can you give us a brief introduction? Thank you so much. Hola, a todos. Como estas? Um, so my name is Lori Tark. The students call me Dr. Tark, but you could call me Lori. <laughs> um, I am part of the physician assistant program at the uh, St. Elizabeth University, formerly College of uh, St. Elizabeth. Um, I'm the director of clinical sites there, uh, as well as a professor, and I teach in the topics of diversity and inclusion, leadership, and um, you know, any, anything that comes to patient quality, safety, things like that as well. Um, and pretty much all of the stuff that anyone with a black suit would do uh, in, a, in a hospital system. So um, I'm first generation uh, American. My parents are from Cuba. I look like a big German girl, but I'm 100% Cuban, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, you know, I have that experience of um, growing up with half a foot in Cuba and half a foot in America. You know, and uh, it gives me a unique perspective into the students that we have at College of St. Elizabeth. 70% of our students are economically dis disadvantaged uh, and Pell Grant eligible. Um, well over 55% of our students are Black and Hispanic Latina. Uh, so, so we really, 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 um, you know, some, some, some places of education say that they're into social justice. We're really into social justice here. Um, it's part of our mission. It's part of everything we do. It's woven into our policies for employees. We're all about diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, and so with that being said, uh, you, you know, you're going to see a lot coming out from, from our students as well as our faculty. Uh, for example, this past year, um, you know, we did a virtual camp for kids across the nation. It went international, actually, uh, taught by the students uh, in Spanish and in English to, to uh, increase, you know, equity and equality to the sessions. We, uh, you know, volunteer at food pantries, things like that. But, but one of the most significant things that I've seen in, in our program specifically is that we've turned the statistics upside down uh, on medical students. Okay, so... Uh, you know, in a physician assistant program, typically you've got over 75% of the students who are white and everybody else is the other 25%. I, I could tell you that we are well over 55 to 60%, um, you know, uh, it's flipped almost <laughs> upside down. Uh, so, so I'm very proud of that and I'm very proud of everything that we do. Um, and as you could probably hear, I have my two children here with me. So I have the unique challenges about being a Hispanic mom as well. So, uh, you know, make a long story short, uh, you know, we're very happy to have been invited to this session. And I'm very, very happy to, uh, to contribute anything I can, uh, as well as to the insights of what the students have been struggling with, uh, the technology divide, as well as all of these other, other issues. Well, thank you so much. If being a Hispanic mom is anything like being an Irish mom, <laughs> then um, my heart goes out to you <laughs> because it's been a tough, tough time lately. <laughs> yeah, I've been the uh, second grade teacher, the pre K <laughs> teacher, the professor, and the director all at once. It's crazy. I we forgot that yes. psychology. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, yes. I have don't, my... forget, don't forget the lunch lady, the snack deliverer. Oh. Physical yes. instructor. Yes, I, athletic director <laughs> with no sports. <laughs> I've been getting my daughter on online for her high school. I, I don't know what they're doing. So, so yeah, I have my 15 year old in the down here in Washington, D.C. with me because I felt like needed a little more managing. So anyway, um, I don't want to take up more time with that. Um, Although I could go on about the, the plight of parents right now for many hours, well, I won't. Um, so let's get right to um, the discussion because I really do want to hear from all of you. So um, let's start uh, with really the disproportionate impact of COVID on the Hispanic community. I, I'll tell you, we saw this, we were alerted to this from Zufall at the very beginning and I brought it to the caucus. Um, as we were just seeing disparate uh, outcomes um, in our communities of color. And so 
we saw here really early on higher rates of infection, hospitalization, and death. It continues, unfortunately, to be a great concern. So I'm sure everyone here is familiar with the statistics, but I was hoping that our medical expert could set the stage here for us to, to start and provide some background on what you're seeing in the community. So Dr. Ramirez, do you wanna get us started um, talking through some of those disparate out, uh, outcomes and what you've been seeing in the community? Yes, of course. Um, what we saw is what you've heard also across the nation, um, people of color, minorities uh, have been, uh, um, it is proportionately impacted by COVID infections, by COVID-19 uh, physically and health-wise. Um, there are not real clear reasons as to why in terms of physically or, or because of any kind of uh, you know, physiological differences in, in, in us as a, compared to other people. Um, but it is a lot of it is uh, attributed to our uh, close living conditions, multi-generational families, inability to work from home when we are frontline workers and essential workers. So we were more exposed, we were more um, unable to do the social distancing that was required for us from us in order to be able to continue to uh, to put food on their tables and 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 to uh, take care of our of our of our multifamily multi-generational family needs. Uh, a lot of the healthcare workers are Hispanic and minorities as well, and there was a disproportionate increase in um, in infections in, in healthcare workers as well. Uh, the beginning is there were um, mixed messages and they were not very clear about how we would be able to protect ourselves. So we didn't know how to do this as well as we knew not, know now. And we didn't know how to teach our, 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 our populations. Uh, so it was a very scary time and we were just um, changing what we were doing on a, on a dime, trying to figure out how we were going to protect our, our communities and our, and our families. Um, I think it continues because again, um, the, the financial uh, economic needs of our communities are continue to be very, very high and put us in a, in a rate, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the front lines again. Um, it just breaks my heart when I see our COVID tests coming back and disproportionately most of uh, our patients uh, are Hispanic, but yes, the, the ones that are test positive are Hispanic. So we're really trying to get that, um, that vaccine out and really trying to, um, I can't wait till we open it up to more people so that we can then, and can't wait till March 15th and the 29th so that we can really uh, reach out to, to more of our community. Yeah, yeah, we're very excited about that as well. And, and um, to that, Mikish, uh, uh, Congressman, if I can add, I think- I was gonna go to you next, you read my mind, yes. <laughs> I would say trust as well, you know, I think uh, particularly, uh, to be honest with you, with the previous administration, it was difficult to build, I mean, the Hispanic community and I think minorities need to build a lot of trust to go to some places. And I think that was lost given the, you know, the, all the uh, immigration issues and all these uh, truly uh, uh, tough times to live, you know. Um, so people need to build trust, something that takes time. So they don't go out to the communities, they stop going to, to healthcare centers because they, they just, felt that they're going to be deported or something, you know? So I think there's a big issue there as well that build over time. And um, communication in, uh, proper communication in Hispanic media. I think there's a lot of misinformation in Hispanic media and we have always been saying from the past that if you watch Univision, Telemundo, uh, there's a lot of commercial on PepsiCo, on Coca-Cola, on cars, very few pharmaceutical, very few communication on healthcare. So I think we need to put efforts on building more healthcare education through mass media for Hispanic communities. And, and, and the other is barriers to uh, healthcare. You know, we are Hispanos, the most uninsured group in America. Uh, we don't have the money to do so. Uh, and uh, also we don't speak Spanish, uh, don't speak English well. You know, I, I was reading an article from, I think the University of California, six out of 10, people mentioned that there's a barrier uh, in language to access to care in, in the US. So I think in addition to what the doctor said, I think those trust uh, communication barriers of language and uh, just uh, not having insurance uh, makes a significant impact as well. Can I, I think that's, yeah. say something? Yes, please. Yes, uh, definitely communication and language barrier. 60% um, of the Latino small business owners will prefer to learn new subjects in Spanish. And since the beginning of the pandemic, we, uh, we start a partnership with Univision. We have a show every Saturday at 10, uh, 12.30 called Amigos Univision. 
And that was focused to provide information to uh, small business owners about all the services and education and health, everything that was needed. Um, and we also focus on really small media outlets, newspapers, a lot of them, they become virtual or they are using Facebook lives or, or many other sources. We identify 45 of them and they have been very helpful to help us to uh, send the, across the message to our community. We have the opportunity to invite the Senator Teresa Ruiz. Uh, um, the program is in Spanish, but if someone wanna participate and prefer to speak English, we welcome and we will find someone who translate. If I may. Certainly. Uh, yes. Um, I just want to, at first, I want to thank uh, Sulfal for the great work that they have done and they're doing. Uh, recently, they were vaccinating the seniors here in the senior center in Morristown. And as uh, some of the one of the panelists was asking about who will manage vaccination for Hispanics. I think Sulfal could be trusted with a big amount of vaccination for Hispanics because Hispanics tracks sulfur. Now on, <laughs> on the part of uh, why uh, the COVID affected uh, Hispanics in a great way, uh, there are some data from New York in which uh, they have said that people, Hispanics that die from COVID, 50% uh, they suffer from hypertension. Um, 36% diabetes. So that brings uh, the concern of health in our community, uh, which leads me to one of my biggest uh, concerns and the thing that I dream for, and it's education, education, education in our Hispanic community. I think that we need to allocate locally and federally some funds to have educational campaigns. Uh, somebody, uh, and I think two of the panelists have said about uh, information. The lack of reliable information uh, among uh, the Hispanic community impeded the efforts to combat the spread and to prevent uh, the, the spread. Um, barriers, uh, language, but also uh, many false news. And among us Hispanics, many people go uh, for the news to uh, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook and other outlets and much, much misinformation. In fact, right now about vaccination, uh, I always speak with people directly and I have people that say, oh, I won't get vaccinated. I say, why? And there are two reasons why many Hispanics uh, uh, say that they won't get vaccinated. Number one, one is a religious spread of lies. Uh, they say, oh, this, uh, this is not good. This is not according to such and such doctrine, uh, blah, blah, blah. That's one part. And there are many Hispanic leaders in the nation. I'm talking uh, religious Hispanic leaders that are spreading that. And they have a lot of influence, influence on masses, thousands of people. They have platforms bigger than one of yours. So the second one is um, false scientific information. Uh, one of the people that I say, why you don't get the vaccine? She said to me, well, because that vaccine will affect my DNA and down the line, I will be ill and I will be sick and then come a conspiracy theory. And, and the, 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 um, the pharmaceuticals are doing this because when I get sick down the line, then I get to get medicine from them again. So we need to really emphasize education and reliable information. And I'm going to be blunt. I don't even trust Univision and Telemundo. I will rather to have something else because sometimes there are programs and people that confuse people. You can have one program like the one that probably you have, but then you have two or three people speaking things that are not true. And sometimes when they interview uh, the so-called experts, uh, if they, they, they say something wrong, the people who is interviewing is not uh, able or it doesn't have the pants to say, hey, wait, wait a minute, let's stop there. That's not true. So I think that's uh, very important. And one of the things that we need to understand about our Hispanic community is uh, the level of disparity, socioeconomically speaking. And uh, I think it was uh, briefly mentioned about how Hispanics live 
many people, multi generations in one household. And that's why they didn't have the proper space. They don't have the luxury of saying, okay, you, you have the virus, go sleep in the basement. They don't have that luxury. And I think that as we are talking here, and I think as we are seeing the effects of pandemic, uh, the COVID-19 on the Hispanic community, that brings them not only to the, to the virus and the pandemic, but to the real needs that people, that Hispanic people have suffered without the pandemic. So now we see them more because we are discussing the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, those, uh, I think some of the, of the concerns uh, right now, and as we looking forward with the vaccine to get to the other side of the tunnel, I think the education will be nice because a lot of people, as I said before, and I want to emphasize, are saying, oh, I don't get the vaccination. I will put that on hold. I have even uh, Hispanics who are professionals. One of them is a physical therapist. The, uh, the, uh, his wife is a um, social worker. And I say, are you getting the vaccine? No, we're going to wait a little while. We, you know, we'll, we see what happened with people and so on. So we need a lot of education on, on this part of, of, of the spectrum. Thank you. I want to come in. Yes, uh, please. And as, uh, as we Quaker says, that friend speak my mind, especially in the last part of economic disparity, that definitely we see that. Um, economical disparity we see is why one of the reasons our communities and, and minorities get sick very often, because we don't have the resources to, to buy uh, good food in general. Um, and we work so many jobs. We have people in the community, they work basically two full times and one part time. So what, what time are you gonna sleep? Um, the, 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 the condition where we live. So I, I have some notes and I put, um, one of the things need and it's very important, we need to erase the minimal wage because definitely nobody can live with the, with the wages that we have now. So that is the urgent need. In, in our community. Another thing is uh, we need a universal health care. Everybody has to have the right. It's, it's a human right issue. Everybody has the right to, to, uh, to have a, a universal health care that, that you don't have to worry about what kind of insurance you're going to have, where to go to the doctor, how you're going to pay for uh, and, and, and it's why people ain't going to the pharmacy or the market trying to get some medicine or even under, under counter medicine to, to take care of themselves. Uh, definitely education. We also, we also need to do a lot of education among communities. I will not say, I will not even say not necessarily also for Hispanics, for so many people. Uh, public health has been, I think, in the one of the uh, uh, secrets, I will say, in this country, and so many people uh, are deniers of the reality of a pandemic or infection disease. So we all need to get more e educated in that, in that issue as well. And another thing is health and safety. Health and safety, um, which uh, under OSHA, is a, is a responsibility for the work for the employers to give um, health and safety trainings to the workers, but that does not really happen. Uh, we see uh, employers deny uh, the basic rights of training or a proper a personal protection equipment to the workers. So if you don't have that during the pandemic, the right PPE, of course, you're going to be contaminated. If you don't have the education about basic protocols, you're going to be you you you're going to be affected by. So, so thank you. Thank so, you so much. I, and I noticed oh. that CMR has her hand up, and I yeah, I did want to get a little bit to um, CMR. I'd love to hear what you have to say. I also wonder if you could weigh in a bit, and then I'll go to Senator Ruiz about access to healthcare um, testing. And now, of course, vaccines. So um, I, I said I wouldn't quote numbers at you, but I will mention that <laughs> I will quote a number at you. Yesterday's numbers showed that with over 2.2 million vaccine doses administered, just 6% of Hispanic New Jerseyans have received those doses while making up 20% of the population. So uh, maybe you could um, 
talk a little bit about that as well as um, some of your comments on. on um, sure, thank you. Thanks. Um, and one of the, one of the, um, I love going after Diana, and I thought Diana was going to talk a little bit more about immigration, just because we're both in that same policy. But you know, when we, when you guys are talking about misinformation and Univision or Telemundo, that's actually what came to mind with the public charge, um, when public charge was so big, because I think that we got our community got so many mixed messages. And that affected, especially during COVID, because people were so afraid to come and get help, even come and get food at times, because they weren't sure if that would then affect their immigration process, right? So we received a lot of phone calls of, should I get health care? Should I go get the testing? Is this going to affect my process? And so definitely when it comes to misinformation, I totally agree with every, what everyone else has already said. I think that so many times that makes, that affects people in ways that we don't even understand. And during COVID that came up so much. So before I talk about the vaccine, I, one of the things I'd say is this past year, we saw, you know, like everybody else has talked, this, the economics, how that affected, you know, this past year, we've done things that we never did before, like help with rent um, assistance, with food, giving out thousands of pounds of food. Um, giving out gift cards. You know, we were very lucky to also partner with the New Jersey Pandemic Fund, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Hispanic Federation, who allowed us to give, be able to do direct assistance, right? No, you know, be able to pay a rent, pay, you know, pay medicines and things like that. Um, but the one place that I, and I'm going to come back to this, has been the, the literacy divide, you know, being some being in the space where we have had thousands of applications of people who have come and asked for utility assistance or any assistance, this was a big issue. You know, people, yes, people do have phones, but they use it not for these type of things, right? So social media, the Facebook. But when we were helping people apply for unemployment benefits, there were many people that didn't even have an email, right? So we had to sit down and create emails with people, help them figure that out. And the other place, because we work closely with children, was, you know, parents didn't know how to access Google Meets, how to access, uh, you know, uh, Genesis, you know, whatever it is that the school district uses. And so, you know, we just this past week, right, we've seen the news about the missing children, right, the millions of missing children across the nation. And I would say that that was clearly in our communities, that was an issue, you know, we work closely with the children. And so we were able to talk to parents, but, you know, there were some times that they didn't know that the children were missing homework, you know, so they had a month of missing homework. Obviously, that affects any child's education. Um, it affects their, their numbers, it'll affect them in the future. And so, you know, it, it is not only about the access. So there was a lot of parents that didn't even have access to the internet or being able to pay for it. But then it's how do we, how do they get, what do they do with that, right? So we were able to provide computers because unfortunately here in Dover, the, the, the school district computers that they gave out to the families didn't come in until late October, November school started in September, right? So we were able to provide some laptops to families, um, as many as we could. But then what do they do with them, right? And if there's five children in the household, which many of our families have, what, how do they access? How do they do schooling in that way if with only one computer? So I think that that directly affected our families. And, and of course, childcare for the people that couldn't, what do they do if they have five children? Do they go to work? Do they stay home? Are they gonna get in trouble? What, what's going on? I mean, these are the questions, the, the problems that came up constantly, right? And yeah, there's a moratorium, moratorium for rent right now, but what's gonna happen afterwards, right? How do we open that? You know, There was a moratorium with utility assistance to December. As soon as that was over, our offices was inundated with people asking for help, what are they gonna do? So, I mean, we've seen so much in this year of these things that you don't even think about, but so I literacy divide for, for me has heightened everything. Housing, right? So there's a housing program, great, that's wonderful. How do you access it? Online applications. How do you do that, right? Online applications are mostly in English, not in Spanish or bilingual or, or in any other different language. How do you access? And, and that is the same to say for the vaccine and the testing, same thing happened. When they were looking for testing, thankfully we do have Zufall right in our backyard, few blocks actually from our office and they were great, but they were also very full at times. So if people needed to go get testing outside of Zufall, how do they access it? 
you know, how, how did they get there, right? At some point, CCM was doing testing here in Morris County, but you needed to have a car to go get the testing. Otherwise, you couldn't get the testing, right? So yes, there's things, but are you thinking about the whole community and, and who can access them? And that's the same thing with the vaccines right now. So we've been referring people to Zufall. Unfortunately, Zufall can't open it to everyone, right? Um, this past week, we had uh, St. Clair's had some vaccines that they wanted to give out. They, they contacted us. In less than a few hours, we were able to get all of the slots that they gave us full. But, and people were appreciative, I think back to um, Dr. Ramirez's comment, not everybody's afraid of the vaccine. I mean, we got amazing texts and emails back from people saying, thank you for giving us hope again, you know, and, and so people want to do it. But again, to, to your point, Congressman Cheryl, how are they going to access it, right? So we were able to access this community. One, a lot of the times when you have to register, you need emails. Out of the 30 people that we signed up, only five had emails. Everybody else just gave, gave us texts, like their phone numbers to get te texts, right? To get follow-ups or whatnot. That's the reality that we have in our community. I can tell you for myself, my mother doesn't have an email. For, for me to sign up my mother, I had to give my information, right? As personal and as clear as that. You know, my mother's 79 years old, lived, has lived here for over 50 years, cannot possibly register herself. That just wasn't going to happen, right? So, I mean, this is the reality of the communities that we're living for. So, when your questions about testing and accessing, definitely, but also thinking about how are we making it accessible? Is it really accessible to everyone to even register for any of the things that we're providing them? Thank you. Sorry for Thank my. Thank you. Story. <laughs> and I'd love to hear from um, Senator Ruiz, and then we'll go to uh, Lori Tark about um, the question. But Senator. Um, you know, we've heard this before. I, I know, and this is not a New Jersey centric issue because I know trying to get my mother-in-law in California registered um, who does speak English and does have an email account and yet her facility on the internet is not great and somehow lost her password or something. I mean, we spent hours just trying to figure out how to get online and another couple hours trying to get in touch with somebody who still couldn't figure out the problem to get her an appointment. And not everybody has, you know, um, relatives that can do that, much less if you have a language barrier or have other um, uh, worries. Uh, so Senator, can you talk a little bit about access to vaccines and what we're doing here in New Jersey? So here in Essex County, we're in the thick of it. Um, and I, I, I want to uh, pat all of the team here, including our county executive, who's led really a championship effort um, that still uh, uh, offers opportunities for us to get better in the sense that, and we're addressing that full on. You know, he saw the numbers where Latinos and, and African Americans were disproportionately accessing um, the, the vaccine proportionally to how our communities got compounded. We started a senior transportation program. We, we, we're going into the neighborhoods now that Johnson & Johnson is available and makes it easily, easily more accessible. We've had an event with uh, the Black Pastors Association here in the state. We're coordinating with the Latino pastors in the next uh, coming weeks. A kind of a, 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 a triage approach to dismantling whatever Whatever the issues may be. One, steeped in trust, which you heard a lot of the speakers say, and based in history, right? Like uh, uh, Puerto Rican women in the 50s were used as a trial run for birth control. Have a call, hold it on part three. Good morning, can I have your attention? So, uh, um, you know, it, it's, it's based in historic uh, sentiment. Uh, removing any obstacles if you can't get to the site, providing individuals who um, uh, can speak Spanish and connect, going right into the neighborhoods, running programs with local people so that they, they can say, oh, mira, fulana de tal got it. So it makes it, um, it makes it more accessible and I feel better and I can, and, and I feel okay to go get it done. But I want to focus on something that Siomara said, because this is a long-term pressing issue outside of just vaccines. Government's inability to accept the truth of who we are in our states and in our country is what creates the biggest obstacles when it comes to providing policy and accessibility to resources. If you refuse to create an agenda that includes people who don't look precisely like the 
people who are writing laws, then you will have systemic programs that for decades cuts out generations of Latinos and black and brown communities. That is the truth of this country. That is the truth of government. That is the truth of, of, of states in general. What COVID-19 has done is force policymakers to say, oh, this is not Ruiz nagging about learning loss, which I've been talking about for 10 years since I got elected to office, which is a real thing that has impacted generation of kids that have been handcuffed to zip codes that haven't been provided quality public school service. Now, all of a sudden, because it is whipping around every community, people are connecting and then turning to me and saying, well, what are we going to do about it? So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a point of frustration, but it's really a point of opportunity to get off. I, I use this, I use this metaphor at the time. I don't know if people want here ever watch Scooby-Doo. I, I don't know if anyone ever watched Scooby-Doo. Remember Scooby-Doo would take off and go running, but they would all stay in the same spot. Uh, you know, government tends to have the Scooby-Doo syndrome. Let's take off and you stay in the same spot. If you keep doing the same thing over and over again, you will continue to cut out individuals. The state of New Jersey has uh, an ITIN community. This is undocumented individuals who contribute over $600 million to the budget. And we have done nothing to give them just a one-time benefit uh, plan. The federal government has completely just denied undocumented communities an opportunity to receive some kind of stipend. If you are aware that the way our country functions is because of the people who contribute to it, whether we have access to paperwork that makes us Americans or not, then your policy will reflect that. So we have to pause and breathe and realize that we're not one dimensional, specifically in the Latino community, that we're completely different and they wanna box us all into one box. We're not, Puerto Ricans are, are, are Americans. Uh, you know, if, if you came here at a specific time, you had a better path to gain paperwork and, and, and become citizens of the United States. If you're just moving here uh, you know, a couple years ago and you're working and you're an ITIN filer and, and you brought your daughter who's one years old and now is graduating college, she's in New Jersey and doesn't know anything else. But when she goes to apply for a driver's license, that's when she's told that she's not, not an American. So it's really recognizing all those dynamics and then steeping yourself in truth to create real truthful policy. And I will tell you, it is difficult. It requires courage and politics has to be removed from that conversation. This is the time for us to do this. So in March, I will tell you last March at the start of the pandemic, I, I wrote a bill for um, just addressing technology in general. All of a sudden everybody's like, let's go virtual. Well, hello. Uh, I, I'm not so sure if I would have had a computer in my house if I if I didn't have a child, right? I'm not so sure that 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 um, that some of the things I have at home that really didn't lend itself just because I I became a mother or or having some uh, administrator understand that virtual means you have to have broadband service, you have to have a hotspot, and you have to have some kind of equipment. Well, when you can't pay rent, I'm gonna guarantee you that you do not have broadband service to your house because it's very expensive, right? You may have cable, but you're not gonna pay the $80 a month because that's just not something. If the kid, if your child wants to play, you give them the telephone. You can't do classwork on a mobile device. It took every breath in my body and bone to finally get the state of New Jersey to recognize that there was a true technology gap here. And just recently, last month, we're down to a thousand families who are not connected. And then you say to yourself, why did it take so long? It's disgraceful. There is an inherent problem to just understand that we don't do everything great. And that's okay. Leadership is about recognizing what you're good at, and what you're not good at. And to take a moment and say, we really screwed this up and we have to make it better. Just recently, some programs have lent themselves to undocumented uh, residents with the rental assistance and with energy assistance. But it's, it's always kind of like this this grabbing at it because there's still this underlying um it's this it's this I, I can't explain to you but everybody knows it's systemic racism that racism that has existed for eons and for decades and until policymakers really recognize that we're deep rooted in an inequity effort uh 
then then policy will continue to reflect old practices and not pivot to create new opportunities of hope. New Jersey, I just read yesterday, is one of the worst states when it comes for Latin Latina women are the worst paid wage workers in the entire country. And it's not because we don't have, we're not working in high growth industries. A nurse, I think I just read most recently, could get paid 28% less than their white counterpart. This is someone who's educated and who's in the work in, in the workspace. So what is happening about this? And it's a lot, right? It's everything that's coming at one time. Oh, minimum wage, healthcare. The problem is that government turned its back on creating a ladder of opportunity for many, many, many years. And so I feel like we're just turning the corner and catching up now. And, and then everybody thinks it's this volcanic eruption or a tidal, a tidal wave. I shared with your with your staffer the other day, Jill, my dad came here. He was getting paid 90 some odd cents at a cheese factory at one point in time. And then God knows what the minimum wage or whatever it was that he was getting paid. They were able to purchase a home. Those opportunities don't exist. Our communities are so far away from being able to just climb up the ladder or just get to a finish line because everything is so disproportionately connected. Our public school systems are disproportionately connected. Access to healthcare is disproportionately connected. Uh, employment the same way. Look, and here's another thing for all for all of us on this phone call, our families like to go to offices. They like to pay taxes in person. I don't know if all of you, I see you, not in, they like to go down and, and go to the cable store and pay taxes. So the unemployment thing is a real issue. They, they like to go to the unemployment office and deal with the case just because if they're on the phone and they have an accent or they're struggling, it becomes just a huge barrier of, 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 of just making that, that communication and that connection outside of whether you have an email address or, or access to a computer. So I will tell you that for me, COVID-19 has compounded our communities. We were struggling before this. The agenda that we're talking about here today is an agenda that I can point to five years ago, but it is time for people to recognize that we're either going to get off the hamster wheel and really create equity in these spaces that require a lot of courage and a lot of volatile discussion that's deep rooted in passion because different sectors are not going to agree with, with whatever we do. And that we're not giving things to human beings and taking away from other human beings. That, that ideology has to be stripped back. My neighborhood is, is diverse. Some of us are quote unquote New Jerseyans by paper. All of us are New Jerseyans because we're making the state work. And if any one of us gets removed from that equation, I will tell you that everyone on this phone call would get impacted in a negative way. And so until we speak truth to power about who we are, what we're capable of, and, and the courage that is deep rooted in it, I mean, it's really time for us to rise up and say things haven't worked uh, in decades before us. And either we're going to create a policy of change here or we're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again, which is going to leave generations of, of uh, children and families out of the potential of an American dream. Sorry, I really diverted there, but. No, I think you uh, provided a lot of great insight, which is why you're such a wonderful advocate, I think, um, in Trenton and for New Jersey. And your, your voice is so critically important and your fearlessness is so critically important. Um, I do unfortunately um, have to go. Uh, I think, Jill, can you stay on? Because I did like Pastor Silva's uh, recommendation that we come up with some action items, which we can certainly do. Um, you can reach out to my office. Uh, you can say them today um, as we move forward. I'll t I do wanna say this has been a struggle. Um, again and again and again under the last administration, we uh, were working to fix, um, we put out regulations, they would be misinterpreted by the administration to the point where even um, people eligible for benefits if they were living with someone who wasn't eligible would not be getting those benefits. Um, even people who are frontline workers were not always eligible for benefits. And I think, you know, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would suggest that part of the reason we've seen such horrible numbers for the COVID outbreak in the Hispanic community is because they weren't getting the unemployment support and had to go in day after day and, and, and really um, had to be on the front lines oftentimes without any worker protections. But um, that 
I'm proud to say that our Senator, Senator Menendez is leading the fight for comprehensive immigration reform under President Biden. It's not perfect, um, but it is a very good start. I think it will be broken up and hopefully we can see um, some portion of that get passed uh, through the Senate. It'll get passed through the House, um, but, but the Senate will be more challenging um, to start to address some of the issues you said. I'll also say Biden has said for months, it, it has been his agenda to get kids back to in-person school, which has been my agenda. I've been um, requesting that the governor prioritize mm -hmm. teachers and vaccinations since December, and I know he's moving on that now. Um, I know Biden's also um, now forcing states to move forward on that, which I think is good because um, I just, if you guys noticed, I was distracted for a second. Um, it was because I was getting a call from the school to say that my son up in New Jersey, I'm down in Washington, was marked absent. So I'm madly texting, why aren't you in school right now? What is going on? Um, I, you know, and, um, and I'll tell you, uh, I find Genesis, which our school uses, I find Google Classroom. Uh, it, it took me months to, to figure out where the hell to go on that platform. And each teacher put stuff in different places, especially before we got used to this virtual online. Um, if I didn't speak the language, um, if I didn't have, it wasn't just me trying to figure this out, my husband would get engaged if I didn't have any support. Um, you know, I, I don't know where we'd be. And, and that's, and I'd still say my kids are suffering learning loss. And this is best case scenario, much less if children just haven't even been online since March um, and have, you know, the, the missing children. So I know that's an agenda of Biden's. I'm on the education and labor, this committee, this Congress, I, I just joined that and in part, for many reasons, I joined that for many reasons, but in part uh, because of my own experiences and, and I my firsthand knowledge that our children across the country are suffering. Many of our children, if we don't act in the next several years, the, the coronavirus pandemic will um, set them on a different path for their life, a, a, a worse yes. a worse path than than one that they should be on. So so that is certainly something. I want to continue to address and hear from our communities about how it's going. I'm going to uh, leave uh, Jill or Kelly to moderate um, and to um, take notes as they always do such a great job so we can continue to advocate with respect to the pandemic legislation um, for coronavirus relief has been written. There is rental support and mortgage support. So not just um, a moratorium, but actual support written into the legislation, which hopefully um, will be helpful. There's also, what, which is critically important, state and local funding. It's just in the, a fight on the floor of the House last night about tr people trying to take away some of the state and local funding in the Senate. Um, so we are working hard to make sure we keep the state and local funding intact in um, the final bill, uh, because that will be not just given to the state, but to our local communities to, to continue to help with, with our vaccine related issues. The next reconciliation bill will be infrastructure, um, but so much more will be going into that one too, and that'll likely be in the fall, so we'll have to prepare for that. Um, it's a budget bill. Many people who are um, fans of immigration reform seem to think they're going to get some of that in the reconciliation bill. We want to do that. Um, it's a confusing process in the Senate, but the Senate has a rule that basically you need two-thirds of the senators to pass most legislation except for the budget, you need a simple majority. We don't have two thirds of the Senate as Democrats. We have a simple majority with the vice president. So we are going to see what we can do with reconciliation, but that should be coming in the fall. Um, and and that, um, that's something we'll be taking a close look at too. Um, and I, uh, and I, I should have added that this COVID uh, bill has billions of dollars of support for schools and getting kids back to in-person learning. And, and so I think that'll be a good start and then address it from there. I can't tell you how much I appreciate all of you and your time. Um, I'm really sorry, I, I'm dying to hear what Lori has to say. So I know Jill's gonna, gonna get that to me, but thank you all so much for your participation. I know how busy you are. Thank you for your work in the community. Um, please reach out. We will, please let us know how we can do better at communicating with the Hispanic community. We've hired Spanish speakers um, and we'll continue to work to do better uh, in that end as well. So thank you all so much. And one day I will get back to learning um, Spanish a little bit better. <laughs> that is 
that is a, a constant dream of mine. But thank you all so much and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Um, so we have a, a medical providers call um, that used to be daily and then it went to a few times a week, right, Kelly? And now it's every week. And that started a year ago, I think yesterday. And that was the anniversary of the first. Yeah, the anniversary. So that was, I remember being in DC um, actually with the Congresswoman when this all sort of hit in the first, we said, oh, we have to get our providers together. And we started the first call and it went on from there. And so that's where she has to go to. She's, she's a little bit over. And I know we're over our time and we appreciate everybody. So Lori, I want to give the floor to you, but I also know that um, before I do give the floor to you that we are way over our time. Um, one of the things we've done with these round tables is if you guys are amenable, share each other's emails so that we can not only let you guys communicate, but we'd love to, Kelly and I, set up another discussion so that we can continue this discussion um, and hear from everybody. I know we haven't hear, heard from some important voices on this call, um, you know, how to reach both Kelly and I, but um, we'd love to continue going forward because we really value your time and everything that you've said. So, um, Lori, I'd love to give the floor to you for a few. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, Senator Ruiz has uh, completely lit me up with her impassioned, uh, you know, statements. Uh, but uh, again, coming from the education perspective, I think that's really where the root of a lot of these issues sometimes stem from. Uh, we receive these students, they, they have major literacy issues. They're not college ready. We get them college ready, but but when they get here, I mean, you know, they, they, when I tell you that they have the reading and writing of uh, less than an eighth grader, I, it, it's definitely there. So there's much to be done in our public school systems towards this uh, community. In addition to that collectivism, um, again, the whole concept of collectivism and how Hispanics function as a group and you know how that impacts everything is, is, is definitely a, a huge source of a lot of the issues as well. Um, I could tell you some of these students when COVID hit, they had to go back home and because they're the eldest and you know culturally the eldest female, uh, they have to be the ones in charge of taking care of all the children and all this other stuff. So here they are in a physician assistant program trying to balance all of this out and all of a sudden they start losing their grades. And eventually, you know, if it keeps going, we'll end up getting kicked out of the program that they very much are well qualified for um, you know so so the ones that do have the literacy then they have these cultural issues I mean like even myself you know my parents are down in Florida but they're 90 years old and again even though I'm in New Jersey I am the one that has to be responsible for the food shopping the the transportation I'm calling Instacart I'm calling go go grandma I don't know if you're aware of what that is but it's like you know an intermediary um, for uber for older people um, I'm, I'm like literally juggling all of these things and not only myself and my parents, but my kids and then next door with my aunts and my uncles and because again, I'm the eldest female. And so you're seeing all of this happening and um, and not only that, but they don't have technology. As, like, as somebody else said, I concur with everything that everybody said, but they don't have the technology to be able to, to uh, or, or the knowledge of how to use the technology to be able to actually do something. So again, who do they go to? You know, me, that, that, that student that's in college, you know, who, who has some, some sort of uh, inkling. Um, and then that student, I mean, like some of them are driving to Starbucks because they don't have uh, Wi-Fi. You know, uh, so so again, everything that everybody said here is so on point that um, I think if we were to put a like a word cloud of all the things that are impacting, it's it's an avalanche. Um, but but we really we really need to start at this base level of of and I and I think it starts with just getting them literate, just evening out you know, the, the playing field in literacy and comprehension and in technology, not when they're 18, but when they're five, you know, and, and also addressing the unique cultural issues. So I'm gonna stop my rant now. Okay, thank you very much. That's great. Um, no, thank you so much, Lori, such an important perspective, um, you know, from the college campus. Uh, Cindy. Hi, thank you so very much. And, and I have to, you know, echo what everyone else said, so I won't, I won't do that. Um, but I, I did want to speak to particularly um, two things. Um, new to politics completely, this is my first uh, run and I was elected my first time out. Uh, I will say that I also ran because I did not see 
and here the representation of um, those members of my community. Um, I have a blended family. I have black children. My husband's African American. And so I come from the social justice perspective of, of, of the, that, those experiences. One of the things that I have to say that, um, and echoing Senator Ruiz's comment, is that it starts with government. And one of the reasons that really um, propelled me to seek public office is a town hall wherein our mayor at the time said he didn't see color. And while it is all well intended, it clearly sent signs that you are not making policies even at the local level that represent um, me and those who look like me. I think that in municipal government, um, we have the obligation to look at our budget um, as a moral document. And a lot what of, of what I found, this is my third year, a lot of what I found is that we don't. So I, I think that we have to start looking at when we're looking at our budgets, and this is the time where we're looking at our budgets, where are we allocating those funds? Because where we allocate those funds means how much we value um, our, our, our communities and their needs and how much we're seeing. I will say that earlier, I said West Orange made leaps and bounds um, from where we were because we have. With um, building these racially in inclusive communities, I have seen my administration go from an administration that did not see color to an administration that has actually spoke out um, in support of our immigrant population, has sought to make sure that they are secure and feel secure. We have passed policies with our um, with ordinances with respect to um, how our police respond. We now have social workers that respond to mental health calls with our police department. We leaps and bounds. We've got a long way to go yet, but it is up to us um, who are elected, who are looking at our budgets, not to just simply look at it like I was told, all we do is um, trash collection and leaf pickup. We do so much more than that. And I think that it's incumbent upon all of us to make sure, just like we did with the census um, and Zufal, and, I, and I've got to say that um, Zufal and West Orange, Michelle Blanchfield and Lakshmi Silva, we collaborated with the community and got out there with the county um, during a pandemic for the census and were able to have so many people respond to the census, which was you know, challenging to think about doing during a pandemic, but we did it. And I'm hopeful that when I look at that success of that, um, that effort, that collaborative effort from the county, from Zufall, from our administration, that we're able to do that with this educational um, program that we have to put out there. If we can do something like we did, like replicate what we did with the census to get out there, you know, we were on the census trailer in Essex County. We had a lot of fun. We had blaring um, and, and uh, Deputy Mayor was with me on that on that float where we've got blaring music and, and microphones and people are listening and they're coming out. I think that that's the kind of energy that we have to use. You know, as a Latina, we, we love, we play music all the time and it just it speaks to our soul and our culture while we're cooking, dancing and everything else. So I think that that's the energy that we have to go into um, this um, effort to, to build that awareness with our community. So I, I don't know, I know that um, Senator Ruiz said that the, the county um, has started to have those meetings for um, that type of event, but I think that we, we really should focus um, our energies on educating people and getting out into the communities because I know Zufal um, is, you know, not, not able to provide it for everyone. I know you're providing it for your current um, patients, but we need to fans of that and I'm happy to hear that there is going to be some funding to the municipalities for us to do more but you know I, I, I say that to those who are elected on this call as well locally that you know it is up to us um, it, it's not just leaf blowers and garbage collection it's it's looking at our, our budget and and saying this is a door a moral document how do we best represent all the voices in our community so I'll stop my rant there oh no thank you so much it's been, uh, everybody's input has been so great and I know we've seen in our office throughout this pandemic, like in the darkest moments, seeing the collaboration um, across all levels of government and with community organizations and um, the private sector as well has just been really the bright light. And I think building on a lot of those connections and hard work everyone's put together to, to keep moving forward is gonna be really important. Um, Rodolfo, I wanna give you a chance. I see your hand up there. I remember meeting you way back yes. in um, 2017, maybe in the um, uh, coming to see the West Orange Hispanic Organization um, 
in the basement of a church and, and just being so oh, yeah. the work you were doing then. So it's great to see you again. Thank you so much. I was going to say regarding the technology and all that, they say that invention is the mother of necessity or necessity is the mother of invention. So what we did in our community is like uh, everybody knows how to use WhatsApp. So we created a WhatsApp group with more than 400 people. And uh, we have been communicating and doing everything that we, we, were, we were doing before the pandemic. Uh, there are a lot of things that our community is in need and uh, we have been trying all these years to address it, bringing them uh, to our groups like uh, the police department. You know, a lot of people are afraid of the police for whatever reason, uh, either uh, immigration or, or simply they're afraid of the police. So I have been bringing the police department to our groups, even with a WhatsApp group, I put, you know, we get the information. We bring nutritionists, doctors, immigration lawyers, uh, St. Barnabas basically has been doing so much in our community. They call me boxes of food, uh, flu shots. Actually yesterday they called me if the community is open, to go to St. Barnabas get a flu shot instead of them coming to us. And I'll say either way, we'll do it because you know so many people after this uh, vaccine. So one of the things I really wanted to say is that with so many people undocumented, I know we created in West Orange, the town ID and all that. And uh, that was a couple of years ago, but still, People are afraid, and this morning precisely, somebody asked me, how am I gonna get a vaccine? What type of document am I gonna show? Uh, uh, is there gonna be a problem? Uh, what are you going to do with this, with that? And you know what? What I do, I get the proper information and I send it via WhatsApp to all the members, more than 400, because they don't know how to use the internet, but they know, most of them know how to use the WhatsApp. Uh, they know how to use the WhatsApp and they get the information and they reply. It's like texting, in other words. So I do appreciate the fact that, you know, we have these meetings and I would like to bring you guys one day to, you know, to our group. And, uh, you know, especially the Congresswoman, Senator Teresa, we get together sometimes in some events. And uh, like I said, St. Barnabas has been great in our community working with us. So is Mayor Parisi as well. I mean, we have gotten all the support that we needed. And uh, we got now uh, Cindy, who's, uh, she's Hispanic and that's wonderful. I mean, we've done stuff together and uh, you know, I'm glad. We, we, we're glad to have the Latino involved. But that's one thing that we do have to take into consideration is that we all come from different Latino countries and our culture kind of different and everybody think we all Latinos. Like we are not the same. I mean, we don't, our culture is not the same and people think is, no, no. So that's one thing that we have been working on like in our group, don't be afraid. And that's one of the reasons we name our group West Orange Hispanic, Hispanic. So you could come from Uruguay, Argentina, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic, Colombia, Mexico, it doesn't matter. You know, we all Latinos. So that's why we name it like that. So people are not afraid to come and say, and bring up I, I, the consuls from all these different countries. They always come and, you know, talk to, uh, uh, to their community via the West Orange Hispanic Foundation. But thank you so much for the invitation. And I'm sorry, I'm at work. You know, I have my phone. No, I saw I the page. You know, I'm at the hospital. You know, I'm a healthcare worker. And uh, I'm the director of dietary. And, you know, um, I just like There's a whole other quick conversation I'm sure you could give us a lot of wonderful information about. And speaking of, I, um, you know, we've got, we're getting to 10 o'clock here. So I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and just thank everybody so much for being on here.
um, Jill, myself, and we also have um, on today a core present from our casework team um, who does a lot of our bilingual outreach um, for our casework team. And um, I'm sure we'll be following up with a lot of you to see what we can do um, right. to make sure everyone in the community is aware of the services that, and support that our office can provide. Um, as well. Um, and as Jill mentioned, um, I'll send around an email just to get, get everyone's permission, um, see who wants their email shared with each other. But I think one of this is really just the start of a conversation. Um, and, um, you know, we'd love to keep this amazing group, you know, connected and, and make sure that um, we're all working together and we can help convene whenever needed, but also just get all of you connected as well um, to the extent that you weren't already. Thank you. Thank you so much for Thank your time. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Stay safe, everyone. Bye. Thank